Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to this special panel this afternoon on reporting against all odds journalism in Belarus today. This panel is being jointly hosted by Article 19 and the International Press Institute, IPI. Uh, my name is Scott Griffin. I'm the Deputy Director of IPI, and I'm very pleased to moderate today's session, uh, which I'd like to add by way of beginning was meant to be held in person uh, in Vienna today. But as many of you know, uh, we're currently in, a, in another lockdown here in Vienna due to COVID, unfortunately. So we had to move the event online. Uh, and, and this event was actually originally conceived to uh, come alongside a high level uh, political conference um, on, the, on the resolution of the political crisis in Belarus, uh, which has taken place uh, yesterday and today here in Vienna, organized by the Austrian Foreign Ministry. It was attended by Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, and it was at the ministerial level, so involving representatives from a number of countries, including Austria, Finland, Germany, the Baltic countries, Poland, uh, and the European Commission. And it was the first uh, of this type of high level event uh, designed to discuss resolutions to the current crisis in Belarus. Uh, and we wanted to use this panel as an opportunity to ensure that uh, core human rights issues, in our case, uh, freedom of expression, uh, were given uh, the attention that they deserve uh, as these discussions were ongoing. Uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're very happy to have this event online. It's still an extremely important uh, discussion. Um, and I just want to give you a few statistics uh, before we jump into the panel. Uh, according to the Belarusian Association of Journalists, um, journalists have been detained more than 500 times uh, since last year's fraudulent pres presidential election in Belarus. Uh, 130 have been sentenced to different forms of detention. And there are 30 journalists still behind bars in the country, according to the BAJ. There have been 140 raids on media outlets. Access to more than 100 news outlets and political platforms have been blocked. And more than 275 civil society organizations have been deprived of their legal status or liquidated, including the Belarusian Association of Journalists, Belarusian Pen, and Press Club Belarus. So these are just a few figures to paint uh, this vicious crackdown that has been ongoing against the media, against free expression, against civil society since last year's presidential election. Uh, and our uh, role today, our, our job today is to examine this, this crackdown in more detail and understand uh, if there is a path forward and what that might look like. So I'm very happy to be joined by a number of excellent panelists. Uh, today we have with us uh, Hanna Lyubakova, who is a freelance journalist uh, and a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Stanislav Ivaskevich, who is a investigative Belarusian investigative journalist and the head of the Belarusian Investigative Center. Uh, we're also joined by Joanna Shemanska, who is a senior program officer, uh, Europe and Central Asia at Article 19, which is a co-host of this event today with IPI. Uh, and we're very pleased to be joined by, on the one hand, uh, Miklos Harasti, who is a former OSE representative on freedom of the media and also the former UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Belarus from 2012 to 2018. And finally, last but definitely not least, uh, the current uh, OSE representative on freedom of the media, Teresa Ribeiro. So welcome again to all of you. Thank you so much for taking part in this discussion. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to launch into that uh, and, and, uh, and give uh, each of the speakers today a chance to sort of share their perspectives. I'd like to start with you, Hannah. Uh, you've been following the crackdown on media since the presidential elections. Can you give us an overview of the level of repression that is ongoing right now and sort of set the stage uh, for this discussion today? Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you very much, Scott. And thank you to the IPI and Article 19 for organizing this, uh, this event. It's very important. As you mentioned yesterday, this uh, high-level conference on Belarus took place. It was the first event on such a level, on the ministerial level, that focused on the resolution of the crisis in Belarus and, um, and, and what to do next to resolve it. And I must admit that there was a lot of support and uh, all the countries spoke in the same voice. Um, the regime did not participate in the uh, in the conference, uh, sadly, but um, well, no conditions were met to to launch negotiations, negotiations to organize negotiations. That's why perhaps uh, they did not participate. Political prisoners are not 
released and violence did not stop. But let's make sure that there is uh, that event yesterday is not uh, it's not the last one. And let us just think about the next the steps of how to how to resolve the crisis in Belarus. Um, so regarding the media situation, when I was when I was thinking about three events uh, that visualize how the media field has uh, shrunk in Belarus since the past year, I think I should mention those three. First of all, it was uh, June 2020 when police knocked on the door of uh, Igor Osik's apartment. Uh, Igor Osik is my friend. He is a um, prominent blogger, RFRL social media consultant. He was arrested on, on that day. And on the same day, the regime basically blamed bloggers, blamed YouTubers, uh, live broadcast journalists for organizing protests in Belarus. Few months later, Katerina Andreeva, Daria Chutsova, also my friends, two young female reporters uh, were arrested for, for the same uh, reason. They were broadcasting, live broadcasting from, uh, from a rally that commemorated a protester who died. Neither Igor nor Katya and uh, Daria have been released yet. And basically, it's total lawlessness in Belarus at the moment. Since the past year, there have been 500 detentions. Uh, nearly 30 journalists are currently in jail. Um, the second event would be August 2020, when Natalia Lubnyowska was shot uh, with a rubber bullet from uh, a really short distance by a police officer. She had a press vest on herself, so she, she was uh, kind of clearly uh, marked as a journalist, but she was uh, targeted, she was shot on purpose. Um, when I was reporting from the streets of Minsk, I also had to run from riot police, I had to avoid stun grenades, and basically since August 2020, not only we um, knew that we can be detained at any moment, but we, um, we kind of felt that we might be even, even killed on the streets. Um, the third event would be May 2021. So this year, uh, when the largest independent media outlet Tut BY, which was read by two thirds of the population in Belarus, uh, was uh, shut down, was blocked, practically demolished after a series of raids. And just look how it escalated. So I started with detentions, then I moved to shooting, and now it's basically a practically um, a practical disappearance of the of the media field in Belarus. The regime is criminalizing journalists. The regime is uh, banning us uh, as a profession. Uh, journalists were deprived of uh, accreditations. Foreign journalists are practically not allowed in Belarus uh, very often. More than a hundred of uh, independent websites have been blocked. Dozens of newsrooms uh, were pushed out of the country. Um, and basically we're facing now the institutional vacuum in Belarus, which is going to be very difficult to rebuild once the country is free. And I do believe, I do think that it is a disaster situation because once the ecosystem of um, uh, independent media information, um, independent information in Belarus is destroyed, it's going to be very easy for foreign countries to come and spread their propaganda and, and narratives in Belarus. Of course, it's not possible to ban information in the 21st century, but access to it uh, in Belarus is becoming very, very difficult, very expensive. Um, so more than ever, Belarusian journalists need practical support to continue their work. And if I may suggest a few things, uh, if we have uh, if, if we have a moment right now to use uh, to use this for in my like for my introductory remarks, I would suggest um, that um, independent organiz international organizations, government uh, would uh, launch a special emergency program to support free media in Belarus. It has to be really structured, it has to be really well thought, and it has to target those people inside the country because institutions are destroyed, but there are many journalists who are still in Belarus. They work um, anonymously. They cannot report under their names, but they do cover migrants in Belarus. They do cover events in, in inside uh, the country. Uh, so we need to support them. We need to be um, really creative how we deliver this support in Belarus because uh, it is hard, but there is cryptocurrency. Uh, there are other ways uh, through advertising via independent websites support can be provided to organizations that uh, have already built infrastructure of how to deliver assistance to Belarusians inside the country, such as Media Soul, such as BISOL, and, and some other organizations. So there are ways. Uh, it is important on one hand to support 
uh, those already existent, uh, existing media outlets, uh, they have uh, to relocate, uh, but um, they, they had to relocate, but they still work and they're still relevant. They are very important source uh, of information for Belarusians inside the country. Uh, and these will be institutions that will reinvent journalism when uh, the country is free. So let's not be scared of supporting those media in exile because they are very relevant and they are very important right now. And we need to preserve these structures. At the same time, it's very important to support newly emerging media such as Telegram uh, and YouTube because, well, firstly, uh, it's um, nearly impossible or very hard right now for the regime to block them. And there is a lot of hunger for information there is a lot of hunger for new formats. My mom does not have access to Telegram and she cannot use VPN to, to read the uh, blocked websites, but she likes watching YouTube videos. Uh, and it's very important in the regions for, for many people, they prefer you know, this video. So let's invest into content as well. Uh, and there are many youngsters who, who are really kind of ready to create this content. Um, we also need to support citizen journalism Investigative journalists, uh, Stas will, uh, will explain this more, I'm sure. Uh, it's really important to teach them to share expertise, to help with equipment uh, and technology, because very often the equipment is being confiscated. And for many journalists, uh, citizen journalists, people, witnesses, it's hard to buy a new mobile phone in Belarus. Uh, so it's important to kind of uh, make sure that they, uh, they, they get those. Um, the issue of safety and security is of paramount important, uh, importance here, and we need to help many journalists with relocation. Uh, just imagine, I mean, even opening a bank account in, Lith in Lithuania uh, might be really difficult, so let's help them uh, with uh, visas, with uh, uh, legalization, with their status, with registration of their media outlets uh, abroad. Um, I would also not undermine the issue of solidarity and the importance of solidarity. I'm really grateful to, to Madam Ribeira for the work she's been doing uh, for meetings she, she's, she has held with the Belarusian independent journalists. It's very important. The regime in Belarus did not follow the recommendations in the Moscow Mechanism Report, uh, but it cannot ignore criticism and um, uh, kind of this attention forever. There were reactions from Russia and Belarus um, on media freedom, on the event at the UN Security Council so on media freedom. Now the regime has harshly criticized the Vienna mechanism. So it works, it makes them nervous. Uh, so we need more of such actions. Um, and let's uh, mention journalists behind bars uh, because these are not just another kind of case of arrest. This, this is an attempt, another step of, of the regime to destroy us as a profession. Um, I will stop here for now, uh, but I'm, I'm really curious to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And you definitely anticipated one of my questions, which is how can we directly help uh, Belarusian journalists and also a little bit about what, what is the situation on the ground in the country at the moment? How is it even possible to do journalism in Belarus? And we can also come back to that, I think, later. But I'd like to now turn to Stanislav. Um, also, again, a, a journalist, Belarusian investigative journalist, as I said. So it would be great now to hear your perspective uh, on the situation, uh, what it's been like to work on the ground, uh, and just your general take uh, on the, the current crackdown. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, to, to start off, uh, August 2020, it's uh, generally associated with cruelty against journalists, but uh, from the point of view of an investigative journalist, uh, of course, it was also a uh, beginning of a new era when the system, uh, uh, when so many cracks in the system appeared and the leaks just uh, uh, started, uh, started flowing uh, like rain and uh, it was possible for journalists for the first time to actually to get to know a lot of things, how, uh, how the state works, uh, a lot of things about how corruption works. Uh, recently uh, done an investigation with, uh, on uh, Pandora Papers, uh, also using uh, using that information and using uh, these uh, these documented leaks. So this is one positive thing about what uh, has happened to journalism since August 2020. But uh, that's about it. Um, obviously, <clears throat> the, we know that uh, for a couple of months when the when, uh, when the protest started in August, so uh, it uh, the journalists were uh, harassed but uh, kind of tolerated. The real uh, crackdown started in November 2020, when journalists became the prime targets of authorities, uh, first on the street, 
So uh, it started with uh, two young female journalists of Belsad TV, Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chutsova, that Hannah mentioned that they were given prison sentences of two years each for reporting from a street protest. Also in prison, uh, um, they're labeled uh, with yellow marks, meaning that they're prone to extremism, so it limits them in, the, in their rights compared to other inmates. Also, an investigative journalist, Denis Sevashin, is in prison for over eight months now following his investigation about former Ukrainian Berkut servicemen, uh, not known for uh, harshly dis uh, dispersing Ukrainian Maidan, and now working in Belarusian special force units. So the uh, Belarusian authorities didn't question his findings, but they first accused him of obstructing work of police officers by revealing information that they desired to keep secret. And now he's accused of state treason, facing up to 15 years in prison and uh, is regularly put into a, salt, a solitary punishment uh, confinement. So obviously the most popular portal to buy, top management and leading uh, journalists uh, are in prison for over half a year now. Uh, first, the authorities charged them with fraud and now with, uh, with inciting uh, hatred. So uh, for, as these arrests were, uh, were happening, many journalists, including my team, uh, the investigative team, we worked out of Belarus until July this year. Uh, we continued uh, to do uh, investigations by uh, by taking a lot of precautions, uh, not uh, for by, by, ch by changing our SIM cards, by changing the places we live, and when we would get out to uh, to shoot uh, the videos, we would it was like uh, executing bank hits, so someone to watch out for the police, um, do the shooting quickly, jump into the uh, getaway car, and uh, get away before before the police comes. But none of these tricks uh, could help anymore. After July this year, I would say is the is the line which put, uh, which put uh, um, an end to uh, jour uh, journalism inside Belarus with names, because most of the uh, journalists who stay there and who actually um, uh, work actively, uh, they, usually, they usually do it an uh, anonymously. Uh, so uh, uh, first in July, it was uh, the management of Nasha Niva newspaper, uh, still in prison. Uh, there was a crackdown on my team, uh, that's when we moved. Uh, and, uh, journalists of Radio Free Europe. And the authorities, they don't give everybody who they detain large sentences immediately. They seem to force uh, journalists to escape from the country. Uh, they give you a chance that happened with two members of my team. So they were released under the pledge not to leave town. One of them without passport and had to cross the green border. So they were able to flee. But those are the few last ones that uh, stayed in the country and signed their name after, uh, after everything uh, that I described were detained in recent mon uh, months. So one is Irina Leushina, she's the di director of the oldest independent news agency in Belarus. She was detained in August. Uh, in November, the authorities labeled uh, that news agency an extremist group, and now she faces up to seven years in prison for uh, organizing that extremist group. And uh, just a month ago, Irina Slavnikova, who worked with Belsat TV since its founding, has been detained and given consecutive 15-day arrests for uh, old Facebook posts with the Belsat logo on her T-shirt. And uh, uh, we're waiting to see what's going to happen to her. So yes, 29 journalists and media managers in prison right now. So uh, how, it uh, how does it work uh, working from abroad? So obviously, all the main Belarusian media has, uh, has moved out. And uh, uh, generally, as I said, the, there, is, uh, 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 there is a lot of uh, communication with the people in uh, Belarus. Still, there's a lot of people journalists. There is uh, a lot of communication with, uh, with officials uh, sympathizing with the independent media uh, and uh, sending, uh, sending things that give you material. Uh, but uh, yeah, the difficulties, obviously, there is in production. First of all, it's uh, about... Uh, uh, it's about sh uh, shooting the videos uh, in, in our case because we, we produce uh, uh, video, uh, video content uh, and uh, of course get, getting, the, uh, getting the guests, getting interviews and getting the insiders. Um, so we still man uh, managed to, uh, to do that. We hired a team of uh, researchers who find people on social media directly through their colleagues, relatives. That's when we're talking about investigations, it's insiders or uh, key speakers keep their correspondence with them to persuade them to co to cooperate. Same with, same with interviewing some experts. Just try a lot a lot on uh, social uh, social media, uh, and uh, so in the end we have a similar effect, but it's much more costly in terms of uh, time and money. Uh, 
Uh, and generally, the financial pressure is one of the biggest because, first of all, when you move the uh, all uh, offices, so we're, for example, my team is 40 people and uh, uh, practically all the uh, independent media are working from abroad now with the big teams. So the cost of living in many cases is much higher, even uh, if, uh, if you take Kiev, not to speak of Warsaw. So uh, uh, also the best journalists are tempted to leave the profession under the financial strain. Um, and uh, so that weakens obviously Belarusian media in competition with the state-owned media and especially the, the Russian media. Uh, also uh, a bit of specifics for video work. So not being able to do videos in Belarus ourselves puts some more costs on replacing it with motion graphics, actor stagings and so on. So the production itself is uh, is more costly. You might think, well, look at the, uh, the horrible things that are going on. You're thinking about motion graphics and uh, actor staging, but um, we must keep in mind that it's not like the uh, Soviet times when people would listen, uh, when, when saying the truth would be enough. So people, people would listen to shortwave radio because it was the only alternative to official primitive propaganda. Russian propaganda now is uh, very sophisticated. It is hugely funded and, uh, well, very sophisticated, okay. <laughs> Maybe a bit of exaggeration, much more sophisticated than obviously than the Soviet one. And it is entertaining, it has, it has ratings. So it takes a lot of skill to compete against it and uh, hiring, training and maintaining that skill costs money and obtaining that money is still, uh, is still an issue for us nowadays in spite of uh, a lot of help directed to the media by the uh, by various donors it is uh, it is still an issue um, as to the pressure from the west to stop persecution so uh, obviously we've seen uh, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, going on at uh, UN uh, Security Council uh, meetings on that uh, uh, there were rounds of sanctions but one might say that sanctions are not having the effect of uh, liberating the imprisoned uh, journalists. Generally, sanctions from time to time are being, are being uh, uh, criticized for, uh, for, not, for never having achieved the effect on Belarus. But part of the reason for that is that a large part of sanctions only exist on paper. Um, so uh, uh, I'm saying it as a head of a professional team of journalists. We did uh, about a dozen investigations on uh, uh, how um, how the Lukashenko's Begman, uh, Begman's businesses work uh, before and after sanctions. So in particular, what I'm talking about is the EU economic sanctions against the so-called Lukashenko's uh, Be uh, Begman. So uh, they were able, all of them, to bypass uh, these sanctions, to spare their assets from these sanctions by re-registering their companies onto affiliated persons. So with the US, it doesn't work this way. With the EU, it does. So uh, for example, Alexei Alexin, nicknamed the Tobacco King, so suspected to be the mastermind between this huge tobacco uh, contraband to, um, to the EU, uh, and uh, named as, uh, as a monopoly dealer for the Grodno uh, state-owned tobacco factory. So he has a bank in Belarus, and uh, MT Bank, and he is under sanctions. Uh, and MT Bank, Alexin is under sanctions. His MT Bank is not under sanctions because he re-registered it on a company in uh, Arab Emirates, uh, which is, re uh, which is registered, uh, registered at exactly the same address as Alexin's son's company, Petrotrade, which moves uh, cigarettes to the EU. So again, uh, uh, while the U.S. would uh, uh, normally sanction um, entities if they're transferred to affiliated persons, in the EU, uh, you also have this formulation that uh, affiliated persons are sanctioned, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work this way. Uh, so what happens in the EU is that every new, uh, every new owner would be, uh, in this, uh, would be investigated for having direct links with Alexander Lukashenko, and uh, then they would be uh, they would be offered for a new round of uh, sanctions, which uh, uh, can be absurd, for example. So in another example, Alexin that I mentioned, uh, together with uh, Alexander Zaitso, that's uh, Viktor Lukashenko's former aide and believed to be his bagman, and another big oligarch, Nikolai Varabe, the only company called Bremina Group, uh, one of the biggest logistics uh, holdings in Belarus. So Bremena and all of its owners are under sanctions, but Bremena is just a holding company. So the actual logistics company doing business for them on transit through Belarus, uh, hundreds of millions, is called Vlata, uh, Vlata Logistics, uh, uh, which was owned by Bremeno, but uh, 
uh, after Bremeno was under sanctions, they just uh, transferred the ownership of, uh, of that Vlad Logistics to three pairs of managers working for each of the three owners. So Alexin, for example, is represented by two managers of uh, a restaurant that he owns. So now the EU would investigate the connections of two restaurant managers to Lukashenko and probably fail. So, uh, and Alexin's assets and everybody uh, practically, uh, every businessman that, they, uh, uh, that the EU um, put sanctions against uh, for uh, benefiting uh, from or financing the regime. Uh, all their assets are spared, including uh, including in the uh, in the EU, uh, by basically being transferred to uh, to to nominal owners. Uh, so um, yeah, what I understood from talk, taking comments about these situations from various officials is that it can only be changed if brought up by member state by member states. So one of the things that our international friends could do in terms of pressure as journalists, for example, to create grassroots pressure in EU member states by asking their politicians um, about this uh, situation of, uh, uh, of, sanction, of, uh, of uh, sanctions not being real on uh, those interviews that are relevant, uh, those interviews that are, that are relevant, generally from the politicians also. Uh, Thank this, this, yeah. uh, that would help. Thank you, Stanislav. So, and maybe we'll come back uh, a bit again to this issue of what, what can be done. We all already heard from Hannah a number of points and now from you as well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you gave us a lot to, to think about. I'd like to come now to Joanna from Article 19, which uh, as, alongside IPI has been covering uh, the situation in Belarus very closely uh, over the past year. Uh, Joanna, you've been looking in particular about uh, in terms of um, uh, different types of censorship, uh, but more recently efforts to uh, brand media as extremist uh, or extremist content uh, and the impact that, that has then on, on the ability uh, for people to access news and information. Um, so it'd be great to hear a little bit more about these very current threats uh, in terms of the use of this anti-extremism language and how they are affecting the media landscape. Uh, if you could start with that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so it is obviously not new that uh, the Belarusian authorities are uh, misusing the existing um, anti-extremism and counter-terrorism -terrorism laws. Actually, Article 19, uh, we've been flagging this uh, for years that the provisions related to extremism are extremely uh, vague uh, and obviously not in line with international uh, human rights uh, standards. Um, the law on countering uh, extremism was adopted already in 2007, uh, with uh, first materials being labeled as extremist um, in uh, 2008. Uh, but uh, since the beginning of the protest movement last year, uh, the authorities uh, have become particularly active in uh, uh, labeling independent uh, materials news um, as extremists, uh, with the first victim of this being the um, Telegram channel uh, Niechta Live. Um, today, those independent media outlets, uh, what was mentioned already earlier by uh, by you, by Hannah, uh, those blocked uh, by the authorities, uh, those that you cannot uh, just access uh, on your via your browser uh, in Belarus uh, if you don't have uh, some circumvention uh, tools. Uh, they have their own Telegram channels um, and Telegram as a platform has become crucial in uh, disseminating uh, independent um, information. Um, and uh, thanks to this, Belarusians who do not trust the official state narratives uh, can, uh, yes, can still have uh, access to uh, to independent uh, news from the country and, and from abroad. Uh, so following such telegram channels listed as extremist um, is not punishable by law, uh, but disseminating posts, uh, information from these channels uh, can be 
punishable by up to 15 days in uh, jail based on provisions in the administrative uh, and not criminal code. Unfortunately, there, there is a new development. Uh, recently, uh, new provisions have been uh, added uh, concerning so-called extremist formation or extremist groups. Uh, and with this, uh, the situation is uh, very much different because uh, even following such uh, channels uh, or chats added to the list of extremist formation or groups, however we uh, translate it, um, entails cr criminal liability and uh, a prison term. So right now we basically have uh, these two lists. Uh, one is extremist materials, following which is not punishable, and extremist formations, which brings criminal liability for even just being among the followers of the given uh, channel. And uh, obviously nobody can guarantee that the channels included in the um, register of extremist materials uh, won't be recognized as extremist groups tomorrow. Um, so uh, the, the situation is very, uh, very rapidly changing. And uh, as we know also from, uh, from the past, when it comes to uh, disseminating um, information from, uh, from channels um, uh, labeled as extremist uh, materials, uh, it didn't matter if uh, a person shared, disseminated that the information, shared the post on social media, uh, even before the, the given Telegram channel was, uh, um, was listed uh, extremist. So uh, it also, uh, like, it, it is risky for, uh, for everyone uh, who posted once in the past uh, something from, uh, from this, uh, uh, channels um, and uh, it can be also that now that the list of this this, this new list is uh, is is growing and uh, there are already uh, well known um, media outlets uh, on this list of uh, extremist uh, groups uh, including uh, Bella Pan news agency and uh, Belsat uh, TV uh, channel. Uh, and their social media platforms. Uh, so uh, we can only expect that the, uh, the list will be growing and, um, and uh, that obviously will have a chilling effect on, uh, on freedom of expression. And um, there are people who uh, start to unfollow these very popular uh, Telegram channels, uh, being afraid of uh, uh, this criminal uh, persecution. Uh, although there are uh, ways to, um, to stay safe, to use um, uh, tools, uh, digital security tools that uh, uh, can help to mitigate these risks, risks but obviously not uh, everyone is uh, ready to uh, to uh, to take this uh, risk so this this is the i think most recent development when it comes to uh, the whole problem of misusing the anti extremist legislation in uh, in belarus thanks a lot uh, joanna um, and uh, we've had now three presentation sort of uh, describing the current situation in Belarus, which again has has only escalated over the past few months. And as, as Hannah mentioned, we've seen sort of this, uh, you know, going from arrests to shootings and, and going even further. So the situation is is really only only worsening. Um, I'd like to turn now to, to Miklos uh, Harasti, who, as I mentioned, uh, was previously the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Belarus from 2012 to 2018. Um, Miklos, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you know, what you observed, we talk obviously a lot about the protest movement last year and how that unleashed this new crisis, but obviously press freedom in Belarus was under pressure way before that. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about what you observed during your period as the special rapporteur and how that sort of informs your understanding about the current crackdown and how you see the ability of the Belarusian journalists uh, to withstand uh, this situation. Um, and just before giving you the floor, uh, let me remind everyone here Please do send your, com uh, your questions 
Uh, we will get to them, I promise. Uh, go ahead and type them whenever you want, and I will make sure that, uh, that it gets answered. So, Nikos, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, glad to participate. Um, and very sad to hear the news, not surprising, but still very sad. All my previous interlocutors um, um, uh, who dealt with human rights or freedom of the press in Belarus, practically all of them are in prison. So it's it's um, extremely uh, feels one up uh, with the opposite of of meaningful work and success. And I don't like that feeling. And I very much hope that the international community uh, finds uh, more efficient ways uh, to counter this plague uh, on, on European human rights, which as the present day situation shows, is, keeps expanding, keeps expanding. I only hope that the international community is not diverted from the state of human rights in Belarus by the artificially created migration crisis created by Belarus, by Russia, and and uh, actually must not be uh, must not be inconvenient neither for Poland, which is also um, is um, experimenting with suppression of freedom of speech. So um, first of all, since uh, more than twenty years, this heavy crackdown was in a cyclic manner um, changed by the Belarusian authorities with the micromanagement of repression. That, that feature has been there on a five year basis. Um, almost usually around presidential elections, the big crackdown came and in the meanwhile, while, while um, dealing with, 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 with the European authorities about uh, letting political prisoners out and taking new political prisoners, the daily micromanager with this very special institution of 15 days, two week uh, uh, detention has been going on on a mass in big numbers. And um, the European Union all the during these two decades has missed the opportunity to address it. And um, actually, um, uh, even now, as, 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 as it shows in full force, I am afraid that um, the meeting, for example, of um, um, the conversation of Chancellor Merkel with Lukashenko also uh, may, uh, may divert attention from the fact that not only the present day provocations of Lukashenko on the border of Poland, but any coming new provocations can only be stopped by more powerful sanctions, more focused, more resolute uh, dealing with the human rights situation there. And um, okay, now as John has mentioned, um, uh, Lukashenko has been for 20 years, his regime has been for 20 years, a veritable laboratory of suppression of means and methods of, of bureaucratic suppression of human rights in Europe, pioneering for all the illiberals and, and all the autocrats of the region. One was the extremism law, as she mentioned, another was the foreign agent type laws, punishing um, um, togetherness in fighting human rights with, with abroad civil society or abroad forces. And the most important all of them is the very special Lukashenko invention of the triple layered suppression of human rights of anything that going public with assembly or association of, of media, going public has been punished First by, uh, first by tying them to a permission, a bureaucratic permission. Secondly, that permission has not been uh, available. I mean, the bureaucratic um, uh, details have always stopped anyone to obtain 
the permission which was needed, the actual permission. And the third one was the meanest of all, was criminalizing the lack of permission, which was impossible to get. So this, this very uh, tight um, um, suppression was the key to the Belarus situation, and it, it is now access, uh, only only multiplied and 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 uh, magnified by the by the present crisis. So um, let me mention finally one very important and unfortunately also pioneering feature of the system of oppression of free speech free speech in Belarus, namely their handling of internet. Even as um, it is still possible seemingly, if you are brave enough, uh, if you are not afraid of being labeled as an extremist, um, to obtain internet links from abroad. But for example, conflating uh, um, already existing bans of freedom of assembly um, um, to internet presence is a very Belarusian in invention, like, like Joanna mentioned, that, that wearing a forbidden or dangerous and extremist badge on your clothes, on your t-shirt, and show it on internet, even in an empty street, even when no people are present, is labeled as violation of um, bans on assembly. So this conflation is a very dangerous example. It should be also seen and, and, and handled. So um, civil society growingly is the source of, of journal. I mean, already everywhere, the websites of civil society, which are not outright media units, are a source of very, of very important information. So Lukashenko's suppression, which also has been a 20 years habit, um, of civil society also doubles as suppression of free speech. And um, this is a, a very united cause and, and has to be seen as a twin and very important impression. I finish here, ready for the questions. And uh, my main point is the continuity, the 20 years continuity of, of, of this oppression, its cyclic character, and unfortunately, the inability un of, 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 of Europe to confront it as it, as it um, actually should be. Thank you very much, uh, Miklos. Uh, that was that was really informative and important. Um, I'd like to come now last, uh, but not least again, uh, to the current OSCE representative on freedom of the media, Teresa Ribeiro. Um, we'd like to hear a little bit about what your office, uh, which plays such an important role in upholding press freedom in the OSCE region, what your office is doing, what actions you're taking uh, to counter everything that we've heard today so far. Thank you. Sorry, you're still muted. You're muted. I'm very sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for having me uh, today and to have the possibility also to explain a little bit uh, what am I doing as representative on freedom of the media of this organization, the OSC. For those that are not familiar, Miklos, of course, uh, which was uh, the former representative uh, uh, doesn't need my explanation, just two words uh, or three uh, on it. Uh, so um, the OSC is a very, uh, with its wide man membership, uh, 57 uh, participating states and the representative on freedom of the media is an institution uh, of the OSC, of this organization. So uh, we have an intergovernmental um, nature, and this is important also to underline. And uh, of course, uh, within the framework of, uh, of, uh, of the USC, Belarus uh, uh, has undertaken uh, uh, a number of important uh, commitments in the fields of freedom of the media, 
uh, and freedom of expression uh, that, uh, of course, uh, are not being uh, respected. I'm not going to talk about the situation on the ground because we had uh, so uh, poignant um, testimonies here that uh, I uh, don't need to do so, that uh, even are better informed uh, than I am myself. Uh, despite all my efforts to keep uh, direct contacts with the Belarusian um, journalists, uh, which uh, um, which uh, I'm doing uh, regularly. Um, so, what uh, you know, since day one uh, of my mandate, I took office in the beginning in the in the in the beginning of December last year, uh, and since the the, the since I took office, uh, you know, I put Belarusian really uh, high in my priorities due to the uh, terrible situation uh, regarding media freedom that, that uh, the country is, uh, is leaving. Um, and of course, uh, you know, according to my mandate, uh, my first obligation is uh, is uh, uh, to assist the participating states uh, for them to comply with the commitments they uh, undertook. Um, so, uh, so I try since day one to have a dialogue with the authorities. Uh, unfortunately, so far it uh, it has been uh, um, it has been a failure, a total failure. Uh, some proposals uh, have been made that uh, were not acceptable for me. Um, but uh, so, of course, uh, I try to combine this institutional approach uh, with the government, trying to engage in a dialogue uh, and at the same time to, um, to uh, have uh, public intervention in order to um, point out the terrible situation that we have uh, in Belarus, and uh, there are numerous, uh, in numerous, uh, um, countless uh, tweets, PRs, uh, press releases uh, on on the situation uh, on the ground. But what I think for me it's now important is what can we do now? Uh, we have heard. Um, Anna, Anna you, you, you mentioned that uh, one thing that should be important is, uh, is uh, to, to, uh, to have um, a, special, uh, a special emergency program to help uh, those ones that are still in, uh, in Belarus, but also those ones living in uh, host countries. Uh, because they also uh, have are facing difficulties, but uh, so my my uh, you know my participation is very much to uh, to receive some uh, inspiring ideas from you to understand a little bit what can we do, and uh, you know uh, so um, but as far as I understood from some conversation is that in many cases. Uh, some of your colleagues living abroad, they are struggling, not for working conditions, but for living conditions. So it's even, it's more basic than, than working conditions. So this is one part of the problem. And the other one is how can uh, those that are working abroad get information on the ground uh, from uh, Belarus in order to continue to um, inform about the real situation in the country. And, and this, uh, for me, this is very important. How, how shall we address, uh, how can we address this, uh, uh, these two big issues? Um, and, uh, and, and Stanislaw, you, you refer something that uh, is also uh, interesting. What kind of pressure uh, can be used uh, uh, also to, to, to have a transformative, uh, a transformative uh, 
outcome in the situation on the ground. And, and these are, for me, the main, the main questions. How can we uh, together, what kind of, uh, uh, because there are so many layers of intervention. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm in an intergovernmental um, organization, which means that uh, uh, I have uh, this, uh, the possibility of trying to influence uh, um, the government, which unfortunately has been a failure, um, and at the same time to uh, to really expose the situation on the ground. Um, there are other organizations with the different features that uh, could bring something that maybe is different, but, you know, I would like very much, so I'm like all the other participants, what can be done, really? And this is my question. And this question is also um, for you, Miklos, uh, with our, your experience uh, uh, in the UN, etc. So what can we do uh, at the level of the UN, the international community? So at very, very different levels. and what this coalition of, uh, of, of efforts, uh, I think it's the only way to, 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 to have any, to make some positive, uh, to, to, or to have some positive results uh, in this very, very, uh, I would say, not only serious, but very tragic situation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've heard from now five, uh, I think, very excellent interventions, which have given us a lot of <clears throat> food for thought and also raised, I think, you know, the question that is hovering over all of this is, is what can be done. And we already heard a number of suggestions from Hannah at the beginning, but I think that, you know, uh, in the remaining time, I would ask, you know, all the, all the panelists uh, to, to think about this question again and, and maybe sort of intervene once more on that. Um, but in the interest of time, I would say I'd like to go ahead and start putting some of the questions that we have from the audience out to you. And then again, feel free uh, when you respond to also respond to other questions raised by the panelists. Um, but I know that uh, we, we are uh, going towards the end of time and I do want to get to some of these questions. So I want to start with one which is uh, quite, quite recent. Uh, it comes from uh, Matthew Jones from the Human Rights Foundation. And he's talking about this BBC interview that took place recently with, with Lukashenko, which I'm sure that many of us saw. And he, he mentions that in the interview, Lukashenko appeared quite confident, basically, in his ability to su continue suppressing journalism and civil society. And the question is here, you know, to what degree does this narrative resonate with the Belarusian public today, uh, a year after the election? And is there a sense uh, of how public opinion is changing or at what level uh, his support is within the country and, and, and then how else, apart from YouTube and Telegram, can counter narratives uh, be propagated in Belarus today? So I don't know if any of the panelists would like to jump at that question. And again, feel free when you are also answering this to uh, comment in any other questions that were raised. May I add to your question um, a side dimension of the same question? My experience is that between the big crackdowns uh, the result of the regime was to lame, not, not making up liking of his regime, that was quite steady and must not be very high nowadays, but whether it resulted in laming civil societies and, and free journalism's readiness to confront. So has this laming, usual laming effect now stepped into vigor again is my question. Thanks, Miklos. I don't know if, if Hannah or Stanislav would be would be prepared to comment on, on this question about um, public opinion. Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe I'll, I'll briefly. Thank you very much, Matthew, for, for your question. So regarding opinion polls, it's obviously very hard to follow them because there is um, it's, it's, it was practically banned, right, the independent social, sociological research in Belarus. However, we do have access to, to some polling um, that, that um, has been made in the past months, in the past year, um, by various international organizations, non-publicly, uh, they are still doing this. So we see that um, when it comes to the moods of Belarusians, actually nothing changed. The majority is against Lukashenko, and this is very important. 
important. Um, and there are obviously many reasons for that. Um, um, it's very hard for Lukashenko to come back to the status quo given the level of repressions, given what happened generally and why people came out to the streets in the first place before the elections, even before the violence. And even after violence, it became even more kind of, even harder for him to, um, to bring back, back people's love. Um, at the same time, when we uh, um, look at the media blackout, there is a danger that there would be Russian propaganda, that there would be nothing that could counter it, uh, and, and, and pro-regime propaganda as well. So this is uh, now perhaps not um, kind of, um, it is disastrous, but, but it's still not sort of uh, a kind of real huge catastrophe because uh, according to the recent uh, poll made by um, um, recent research made by Mikhail Drashevich, 68% of respondents of Belarusians consider state TV uh, as, a, as a source of fake news, which means that people are deprived of access to independent information, of, to independent te television, for example, but they do not believe pro-government or Russian television either. Uh, we just need to make sure that, we, that this audience that is looking for informa information has some access to it. So what should be done? Of course, Telegram and YouTube are not enough because um, the audience that is already there is sort of um, the, the highest level of it, I would say. We need to come to that audience that is still, I don't know, reads uh, VK, Vkontakte, um, uh, Yandex Zen, uh, Adnaklasniki, those kind of Russian speaking social media um, channels that uh, we don't ac have access to yet. So we need to be more creative. Then we need to think about uh, internet uh, censorship circumvention tools. We really, really need them in Belarus. We really need to have access to it. We need to think about alternative internet and some solutions regarding this. This might be very um, obviously um, creative or something new that I'm saying, but but that's uh, kind of, uh, let's, let's be creative, right? And when it comes to how we get information from people on the ground and how we continue reporting, there are citizen journalists, there are witnesses, uh, we need to help them uh, deliver this information to us. Firstly, the, the information should be anonymous and secure, but secondly, they need to be taught. They need to have training how to be a, a citizen journalist, right? How to sort of pursue this um, and, and, and kind of get equipment from, uh, like with the help, I guess, of, of, of us, of international organizations uh, who could um, uh, help with this equipment and assistance. Thank you very much. Uh, Stanislaw, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to, to add to that. Um, otherwise, no, I don't think so. Um, maybe just a follow-up question. I mean, what is the level? You mentioned uh, sort of ways around internet censorship. Uh, what is sort of at the moment the, the usage rate of things like VPN? I mean, are, are average citizens using these types of technologies at the moment to circumvent censorship? Uh, or how much work needs to be done there to inform people? Uh, if that's yeah, yeah. I'm not, I wasn't sure who. Uh, Joanna, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Joanna would know would know more oh, about this. Um. Uh, well, I I don't know how many what are the numbers, uh, but uh, uh, there are initiatives uh, uh, inside the country and also outside the country that uh, inform uh, the uh, Belarusian society. Uh, about uh, how to use uh, these um, tools uh, and also not only by informing them but also offering assistance in uh, um, in actually uh, making it work on uh, their devices uh, so uh, like the, these uh, initiatives exist and they uh, i think they are they, they are obviously more and more um uh, popular and um, they, they, they have uh, uh, a lot of um, popularity, uh, but unfortunately I cannot give exact numbers. Uh, perhaps someone else uh, is able to, 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 to do that. Um, but uh, definitely the level of uh, understanding and awareness uh, among Belarusians, why it is important to, um, uh, to I use uh, such uh, tools to use uh, VPN at least uh, has uh, has grown uh, since uh, last year and uh, this is uh, surely a good 
uh, thing. And uh, even with this new development of uh, this uh, um, a new extremist um, label of um, extremist formations and new criminal liability, uh, related to that, um, uh, these um, activists and uh, civil society organizations that offer uh, help uh, in uh, uh, installing circumvention tools, uh, they uh, also say that uh, there are ways to, to, to become as secure as uh, to not to be uh, that easily um, found uh, by, by the authorities, uh, uh, even if uh, you follow a, a certain uh, Telegram channel, which is an extremist uh, for formation. So uh, the, the, there are ways and uh, the, there is uh, a growing interest of the uh, Belarusian people um, in uh, how to use uh, such uh, tools. Thank you. Miklos, I saw you raise your hand. Oh, you're muted. Um, it's very helpful to know and the world let's get more creative. I think it's also a call for actions for international uh, sponsors, be them states, be them international civil organizations, be them international organizations. They need financial support. I am afraid that creativity is quite directly linked to the level of support. What I really would like to address is the very interesting um, talk um, by the representative, Teresa. Um, I only know too well the difficulties that are posed by the fact that these organizations, actually both uh, the UN rapporteurship and um, OSC representativeship are very much intergovernmental um, in their character and need a lot of, uh, they can, it's very hard to circumvent protocols that, um, that, were, that were created in order to make it difficult actually. But um, the um, one way which I always found useful is uh, always name the names, the victims. The independence of the representative or of the UN reporter gives a possibility for that. And number one, yes, not only one or two, all of them constantly and, um, and, and often, often, not just once. Second, not behind closed doors, but in public. Maybe they don't, they don't solve the situation of those oppressed. They don't liberate them from prison, but they certainly feel good. They certainly straighten the backbones of those oppressed, gives them possibility to see that the international community is with them, and also gives a possibility for Lukashenko to understand and all those oppressors to understand that they cannot go away by structural, or general, or political talk, that it is about living people and that they are not going to, to be forgotten. So that, that's something that I find within the possibilities of international um, spokespersons, uh, basically ombuds people, what, what a representative is, without much legal power, but uh, power, as the Americans say, of the bully pulpit. Thank you. Thank you, Miklos. And I know that we are, we've gone a bit over, over an hour, but I suggest that we just finish up. We have one more question here, so I wanna make sure we, we get to that. Um, we have a question from uh, Raman, who was asking about, uh, yeah, you know, um, how much time would be needed basically to recover, for journalism to recover after this period? Uh, after Belarus becomes a democratic country. Um, so thinking a little bit, so the depth of the, of the harm that is being caused right now, and how can it be, how, how can the journalistic community recover from what has happened over the past 12 months or so? I don't know if any of the Belarusian journalists would like to sort of take a stab at, at that question. Um, 
or anybody else? Uh, mm, I would not say that um, uh, irreparable harm has been done to Belarusian journalism so far. Uh, the work has been definitely hindered, <clears throat> has been made difficult. Uh, there were victims, uh, which are uh, 29 individuals um, with, uh, who, are, uh, who are in prison. Uh, and obvious, uh, but uh, uh, the journalism, uh, uh, independent journalism in Belarus is alive, uh, is alive and, uh, uh, and working. And we're talking not just about the, uh, the investigative scene, but all the major, all the major portals, all the major media has managed to move the broad and has managed to maintain uh, some uh, more or less uh, secret contacts uh, inside the country to, uh, to continue, uh, to continue uh, broadcasting. So uh, to answer the question uh, precisely, it would not take long, I believe, because, uh, well, generally, uh, journalism in Belarus has been, uh, it's, it's a popular course to take in, in university. It's an unpopular job to take because being uh, an independent uh, journalist has always been risky, while uh, being a state-owned journalist has, uh, uh, has been, uh, is frowned upon by, uh, by many. But, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, the, the current strong base, uh, if we maintain it, that uh, continues to work, uh, will be uh, quickly filled in with, uh, with newcomers the moment that uh, the moment that the moment is right. I'm just going to follow up. In, to three, in of... three countries, in three countries, just a joke in this tragic situation, in three countries, it is the opposite of what Stanislav told. It is um, unpopular to learn about journalism, but very popular to do. I'm sorry about it. No, no problem. I, I was going to ask as well, if Hannah, if she shared this uh, view of the resilience of the journalistic community in Belarus, just very briefly, you know, if, there's, if you still have a feeling of, of optimism. I do have a lot of hope and optimism. Um, I think, um, well, firstly, what I saw last year actually gave me a lot of hope. People were people were literally protecting us from being deten detained by police on the streets, which means that they do respect freedom of speech and they do respect um, information and the right to have information. And they consider it really important and really valuable. So it all depends on how people are treated. Uh, when it comes to us, there is, there was, and there, is, there still is a lot of solidarity between us. We are all together together, we really help each other. Um, and I would say that this is obviously not the first year, right? There the, the always have has been a war against journalism in Belarus. Now Lukashenko wants to destroy it, but uh, we were in the same situation, in, in similar situations before, maybe not such as not on such a scale, but still. And we are sort of used to uh, surviving in a way. Uh, it might be actually positive in this, um, in this situation because we know how to survive. We know how to move our operations abroad and work from abroad in exile. That's why answering the question, how, um, how much time it would take? Well, if we actually preserve the structures, even abroad, it does not need to take a lot of time because we will have this media already and we will just move them back to Belarus and, and kind of reinvent, reinvent journalism. Just to give you an example, when Tutbi White, the largest media outlet uh, was, was shut down, as I mentioned, they immediately, uh, almost immediately recovered. It is now Zerkla, it's another media outlet. They are based in Ukraine, they're based in Vilnius, but they do work and they're still able to report and they're still able to do uh, good journalism. We just need uh, support. We just need more creativity, flexibility um, and uh, technical assistance. And I think we will be fine. Thank you very much for that message. And just to, just to also note, we had a question, uh, an additional question here in writing, you know, one or two practical ways that journalists and others outside of Belarus can support independent journalism in Belarus. And just I can just share your, your answer, Hanno, that you, that you wrote here. Uh, one, uh, partnership with Belarusian journalists, collaborative and cross-border projects, consider giving Belarusian journalists space in your media outlets. Uh, and the second suggestion that you had here was, yeah, just report about the situation in Belarus, focus on human rights violations and repressions, uh, but also write about journalists who are jailed. So I think those are also excellent um, points. Um, the, we just had one last question. I'm just gonna read it out one second. Um, from Helga, she's asking, uh, how can European countries uh, secure the education of the next generation of journalists? And, and sorry, there was one more uh, question as well. Is there a specific source of financial or other support to which journalists and others can contribute? So let me do this. Let me uh, give panelists a chance to address either or both of those questions combined with maybe just one final message 
from you if there's anything that hasn't been said that you feel uh, needs to be said today or put on the table. I'll just ask you for, for a final comment before we wrap up. I don't know, any, anyone, can, anyone can begin. If anyone has, has a final comment or an answer to, to either of those questions. Um, may I? Please. Uh, Please. Yes, um, just one phrase of, 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 of the remark. Remark of Hannah is crucial that, that there is something good in this very dire situation, a great generation is growing up, which shows the future of the country. And I'm very glad to see that. Uh, keep, keep going together <laughs> and, and you will win. Thank you, Miklos. Um, maybe uh, Teresa Ribeiro, any, any final comments? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I was uh, trying to find, uh, to raise hand, I, 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 <laughs> I can now. I was not complaining about the limitations of, uh, of the mandate. On the contrary, I think that is a very important mandate. And one, this is, of course, make it more difficult but at the same time is uh, to be in an intergovernmental organization, give us the possibility to have access to the political level. And this is something that we need to value a lot. Uh, so we need to combine really uh, this possibility of reaching out, um, of uh, denouncing, um, but at the same time to give a chance uh, to engage uh, with, the, with the political uh, authorities. In the case of Belarus, of course, it's very, very difficult, um, but still, um, I think that uh, as within the UN, Miklos, you, you just mentioned, or within the, the OSCE, uh, this kind of mandates uh, um, uh, are very important and they can have um, a real impact. Uh, if I did not believe in it, I wouldn't be sitting here uh, in, uh, uh, in, my, in this chair, definitely not. Thank you. And of course, uh, we'll continue to, uh, to try to work together and really to uh, try to, to improve the situation and change the situation. This, I think, uh, it's very, very important. Thanks. Uh, maybe, Joanna, any final comment from you? Anything that hasn't been said? Uh, yes. Um, now when it comes to uh, the question uh, you had uh, earlier about what, uh, what can be done, um, we mentioned uh, earlier also, I think it was um, uh, Hannah and uh, Stas uh, uh, telling us about the importance of, uh, of this uh, new content and uh, um, innovative uh, content uh, and the use of uh, uh, also social media platforms um, uh, to disseminate uh, such, uh, such content. Uh, and um, there are quite a lot of issues uh, related uh, to uh, these big tech companies um, that uh, Belarusians uh, use uh, both to uh, create and disseminate independent um, uh, content, uh, but also to receive such, uh, such content. Uh, so uh, when we are talking about uh, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, but but ma mainly YouTube, uh, which is uh, uh, like an independent TV for uh, for many people, um, uh, we should, as a civil society, and I think especially um, uh, international uh, uh, human rights organizations. Uh, we could look uh, into the um, issues that uh, Belarusian bloggers, journalists uh, face with, uh, particularly with uh, uh, YouTube. Um, so there's been always uh, issues around the transparency, lack of transparency, uh, when it comes to how they uh, moderate the content, why the, some content uh, is being blocked. 
uh, there are no reasons given uh, for that. Uh, this is a universal problem of, uh, of, this, um, of these platforms. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, Belarusian uh, um, YouTube uh, channels, uh, the, the problem is the lack of expertise of, uh, of uh, YouTube uh, dedicated to, to Belarus, uh, not to mention that the, the Belarusian language is not even um, recognized as a separate uh, YouTube uh, language. So there is like that, that obviously affects uh, uh, not only content moderation, but also the fact that uh, these uh, independent uh, bloggers, they cannot um, really advertise and receive money from advertisement uh, if they uh, post uh, content in the Belarusian language and not in the Russian uh, language. And, uh, uh, and basically, the, also the fact that uh, um, Belarus um, and the content related to Belarus is uh, managed uh, by the teams that uh, focus on uh, on Ro Russia and the Russian uh, language, so um, we could help even by by that by demanding from uh, from these uh, so social media companies to uh, to become more transparent and to become uh, uh, like uh, to 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 address the the the, the issues the challenges that. Uh, uh, Belarusian users uh, face on on the platforms, and just to add, like uh, I recently uh, just googled, I used Google um, engine search and I googled uh, in Russian like uh, Belarus news, and all the links I got, like the first page, it was only uh, state um, media outlets, links to uh, state media outlets uh, or Russian. Uh, Kremlin uh, media outlets. Uh, I, I think there was only one, it was, I think, Deutsche Welle that uh, came out uh, as the only independent source of information that uh, appeared uh, when I tried to, uh, to Google uh, Belarus. So this also shows the, the, the problem that we have with these big tech companies being far away from Belarus, perhaps not understanding uh, the uh, the situation, but also unfortunately, uh, not being willing to uh, not willing to um, to have a dialogue with uh, civil society, with independent journalism, and um, being in uh, good terms with uh, the authorities. So this is something I think like what our organization, together with other organizations, could address in the nearest future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Let me turn to Stanislav, if you have any final comment, anything that hasn't been addressed or that you would like to mention before we finish. Yeah, uh, well, <clears throat> obviously, uh, uh, solidarity with uh, everything that has been said before. Um, I would just add two things. So uh, first of all, that it's, uh, to what Hannah said about preserving structures, it's true that uh, it is very easy to revive, fairly easy to revive journalist, uh, journal, uh, Belarusian journalism now when all the main media are alive and working. But once you lose the the core teams uh, to the profession, this is uh, uh, this uh, loss is going to be harder to recover. So it is important to uh, both support the journalists uh, who uh, are in need temporarily because of the situation, but also to direct the help in a, com <clears throat> in a competitive uh, fashion to, uh, to stimulate healthy competition uh, so that uh, the Belarusian independent media is able to compete also against the, uh, against the state uh, pr propaganda and, uh, and Russian propaganda. And uh, the second thing, yes, uh, the, uh, obviously it is important for our international friends to keep up the topic and thank you very much to the organizers uh, to keep the Belarusian topic up in the uh, international media. And uh, <clears throat> I hope the information uh, about the sanctions that I just shared today will, uh, will find some, uh, so, some effect somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Hannah, I'll give you the last word. Any, any final message? I saw that you mentioned something in the chat as well about not legitimizing Lukashenko, but any, any message that you would like to, to share with, with us at the end? 
Uh, that, that was regarding uh, a previous comment, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for 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 the work that um, every panelist um, has been doing is doing. Um, I saw that there was a nice Maren um, in the chat, so so she she's been doing an amazing job as well. And it's all very important. International um, organizations are very important. So rest, re let's raise the issue of Belarusian journalists of uh, repressions inside the country, on the international arena, on the international level. Um, and again, uh, I think my most important message right now will be to uh, firstly help journalists directly. They need to pay legal fees. They need to receive psychological support. Uh, they are victims and that they, they have been repressed. So, so they need this uh, support to recover. But we also need to think about institutions and about structures. And here, promotion of, promotion of independent journalism, uh, promotion of uh, journalistic standards, uh, direct technical assistance to already established media outlets but also newly emerging formats is really really important so um so let's invest in journalism in belarus now so that we don't really use it uh, lose it sorry and what stas said is really important like many journalists are leaving the profession because they just cannot um pay um their bills so so we cannot allow that and we need to help them thank you Thank you so much. And maybe just to add that you, uh, in response to the question we had here about specific sources of financial and other support to which journalists and others can contribute, you mentioned here two crowdfunded platforms, uh, Media Soul and Buy Soul, just so that everyone else was able to, to hear that. Um, I think that we'll uh, stop here. I want to thank uh, all of the all the panelists for joining us today. We heard, I mean, obviously we heard the situation is very bad and getting getting worse. Um, it's been an awful uh, year and, and a couple of months for journalists in Belarus. The repression is worsening, the crackdown is worsening, uh, yet there's also a sense that hope is not lost, that there is resilience, that journalists are still working, and that we need to do whatever we can to support them, whether that's solidarity or direct support. Financial support is also important. Practical support is important. So there are a lot of things that we can do and that we must be doing uh, to keep journalism in Belarus uh, but also uh, the work of Excel journalists alive. So I want to thank everyone again. Uh, thank you all for joining this discussion. Thanks once again uh, for the panelists for taking the time to, to inform us about the situation. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again.